Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? This is a program in which we are focused all together on the Bible because the Bible is God's Word. It is, by all odds, the most important book this world has ever known or will ever know. It is the Word of God. The Bible is not a new book. It was completed almost 2,000 years ago, and uh, uh, there has not been a single change in any of it since then, and that is insofar as the uh, Bible in its original languages of Hebrew, mainly in the Old Testament, and Greek in the New Testament. It is true that various publishers have come along with uh, various translations and publications in which they have made changes, but but uh, the, the, those kind of changes are not trustworthy. The only thing that we should be looking at is the Bible as it was completed about 2,000 years ago. And uh, it is the Word of God. Now, it's one thing uh, to know that it is written by God and therefore absolutely trustworthy. But God wrote the Bible in such a complicated fashion uh, so uh, that it is possible to derive wrong teachings from the Bible by well-meaning people who think that they ha are finding truth. And so the Bible itself guides us as to how we are to conduct ourselves as we search out truth in the Bible. And uh, the biblical uh, admonition is, is that we are to compare Scripture with Scripture. We are to, uh, whatever conclusion we d develop as we read the Bible, it must be tested by any and every verse in the Bible, no exceptions, that might relate to that particular teaching to make sure that we can harmonize that other, those other verses that we, that might relate into the conclusion that we've derived from taking a few of the verses and arriving at that conclusion. Now, this takes a lot of hard work. It means that we have to be constantly on the lookout, uh, constantly searching the Bible. And uh, But unless we do that, it's very easy to be told, oh, what I'm teaching you is right from the Word of God. It is absolutely trustworthy, and yet it may be exactly opposite to what God really is teaching we must be ready to look at the whole Bible. And that's one of the reasons why we're having a program like the Open Forum, because this gives opportunity for anybody to call up and say, look, I hear you're teaching this doctrine or that doctrine, and there's a verse over here in some obscure part of the Bible that you may not have looked at, which seemingly... It runs counter to just teaching something different than what you are teaching and uh, 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 therefore are you sure that you have the truth and we have to welcome that kind of a call we want to look at that obscure verse uh, because if we can't harmonize it into uh, our teaching then uh, that is so that we don't see a contradiction then we uh, know that our original conclusion may not be trustworthy. And if we come to a, what we think is a conclusion of what the Bible is teaching about some doctrine, and we begin to teach that and it is not the truth, then we are committing a magnificent and terrible sin because we are daring to say, Thus saith the Lord, and the Lord has not said. And that's a dreadful thing to do. It is to make a lie 
on uh, using the Bible as our authority for that lie. And what a terrible thing. And that is actually the characteristic of an enormous amount of the preaching that is done today. It is all kinds of pastors and evangelists and and Bible teachers are teaching uh, the Bible teaches this or the Bible teaches that and they have never looked at many verses that relate to these things that they claim the Bible teaches and without realizing it they are teaching lies and using the Bible as their authority to teach lies and uh, that is exactly the way Satan comes as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness this language Satan coming as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness are not words that I have designed those words come right from the mouth of God they come right from the Bible and and uh, this is exactly what has been happening in the churches that any doctrine that is taught and claimed to be this is faithful to the word of God and is not faithful to the word of God actually is from the mouth of Satan and not from the mouth of God how dreadful how dreadful something that we would never never have envisioned a few years ago that this could be possible but as we study the Bible we find that's how serious the problem really is but this is your program we want to hear from you and so shall we take our first call tonight please good evening welcome to open forum good evening brother Kate yeah how you doing this very well thank you oh that's good I, I really like your show I just wanted to um, get some help from you I was trying to figure out Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. Let's look at that. Galatians is a little book in the New Testament. And uh, here we find God saying to us in Galatians 2.20, using the Apostle Paul as the spokesman, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, what is your question? Now, this applies to all the true believers, right? That Christ lives in them? Yes. You see, we read in John chapter 14. Uh, here's a further commentary on that. In John 14... We read in there where Jesus said uh, uh, in verse 23, If a man love me, he will keep my words. That is, he'll have an intense desire to do the will of God and be obedient to all the commands of the Bible. Then he goes on and says, And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. In other words, uh, God himself uh, indwells us. Now, we don't understand that, of course. How can Almighty God indwell my, my soul in my, my spirit essence? That's a mystery. But nevertheless, that is the language God is using uh, here. And uh, therefore... Uh, he is the one who energizes the true believer. Uh, he is the one who has given us eternal life. And, uh, and he, it's all because of the faith of the Son of God, that Christ was faithful altogether in following the law's demands that he become sin on behalf of this individual who now is a child of God. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Camping. I just have two more verses that I would like to apply this to that I'm trying to get some understanding from. Uh, in Luke chapter 4, verse 2. Luke, Luke chapter 4, verse 2. There we read in Luke 4, verse 2. 
uh, Jesus, let me start with verse 1 to pick up the context. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted or tested of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. Now, what is your question? Okay, that, that means he fasted, right, 40 days or something pertaining well, to that, or he didn't eat anything? Well, yes, 40 days is a, is a number that God very frequently uses as a testing period. Remember, when Israel was in the wilderness, Moses went up on Mount Sinai and disappeared from their view as he received the law from God, and he was on the Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, and uh, God actually was testing Israel. Now, what are you going to do with Moses gone? And they failed the test. They made the golden calf, uh, went into complete rebellion against God. They were 40 days, in, 40 years in the wilderness, uh, and and there were some other 40s in the Bible, but 40 is commonly used in the Bible to signify a testing time. In the last verse, I, I wanted to, I was trying to put those two together with this one to get some understanding. Is Matthew 17:20 20, verses 20 and 21? Matthew Let's 17. Let's look at Matthew 20. No, Matthew no, 17, 17 rather. 17. Matthew 17 verse 20 and 21 and Jesus uh, uh, this has to do with the time when uh, there was the uh, young boy that was beset by evil spirits and and the disciples were unable to cast out the evil spirit and then Jesus said in verse 17 O faithful, faithless and perverse generation how long shall I be with you how long shall I suffer you bring him hither to me and Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that same hour that very hour then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said why could not we cast him out and Jesus said unto them because of your unbelief for verily I say unto you if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Now, what is your question? Okay, it makes it sound like in order to obtain the faith uh, in that chapter of Matthew that you have to fast and pray but then when you put Galatians 2:20 and um, Luke chapter 4 verse 2 it makes it sound like Christ does all the work well now, Christ always does all the work you know we but uh, but let's first of all if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed in another place God uh, Christ had declared that the kingdom of God is like a grain of mustard seed. And so we have definition here so that we can say here, if you have the faith of the kingdom of God, and the faith of the kingdom of God means you have Christ, because he's the very essence of that faith. And the mountain that's, uh, that is removed because of uh, Christ being our faith is the mountain of uh, of the kingdom of Satan. He is the destroying mountain that uh, that is finally cast into hell forevermore. Uh, and every every true believer has overcome Satan. That is, we have been taken out of his dominion. We're no longer under his authority at all. Now, when he said, this kind cometh out, but by prayer and by fasting, our prayer has to do with communicating with God as we beseech him that he might undertake as we pray for a loved one or a friend who we're hoping might become saved. Our God has to do it. And fasting is a figure that God uses uh, he defines this in Isaiah 58, as a matter of fact, 
as the matter of sharing the gospel, of bringing the gospel. When we are bringing the gospel, we are spiritually fasting. This is where uh, this is what fasting identifies with. Thanks but, a lot, Mr. Camping. I appreciate it, and thank you know, you. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, good evening, Harold. Thank you for taking my call. Go right ahead with your call. Okay. Um, I appreciate your show. Thank you. Um, and, uh, I, well, my question is, um, I think it's Luke 950. Um, that verse um, talks about... Um, they before us and they're not against us. You with me? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm missing something here. Uh, if uh, Luke nine fifty. Luke nine fifty. Okay, I got that now. Luke nine fifty. Luke nine verse fifty. There we find, And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. All right, now, here we find that God is anticipating the fact that uh, the gospel is not going to be, uh, throughout the church age, is not going to be centered in one uh, denomination or one congregation but that it will spring up in many, many places through the world. Uh, here are the disciples. They have been with Jesus, and uh, they are therefore at the very fountainhead of truth. And here comes someone along who is also teaching like they are, and they don't know who they are. And uh, they are apprehensive about this and ask Jesus, Shall we forbid him? Uh, is uh, is uh, is really what what God, they are asking, and uh, and they said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. Then Jesus laid down a principle that is, if whatever someone is teaching, if it is not against the word of God, then it is for the Word of God. Now, that, in other words, it is, does not depend on the fact that they have to be part of the same group of people uh, that, that believe they have the truth. They can spring up altogether independently. You have to remember, when we think about the Bible, as it is sent out into the world, can God work truth in the lives, in the heart of an individual in Africa, just at the same time that he's working truth in the life of an individual in China or in uh, Los Angeles? The answer is, of course, because it's all the same authority. It is the same Bible. It is the same gospel. It is the same Holy Spirit. And bear in mind that it is God, the Holy Spirit, who brings anyone who does come to truth to truth. And so this is... This is what we can expect. We don't have to think that uh, if someone else comes up and has uh, begins to have the same truths that that uh, they somehow have stolen it or whatever. It, it, the fact is that uh, if we're using the same Bible, uh, God can work in the lives of many people in different parts of the world simultaneously. That's very nice. Thank you. And um, I have one more question. Yes. Okay. Um, the Apostle Paul, um, I perceive like he struggled a lot in the flesh. And, you know, when he talked about the, the, you know, the flesh, like he wants to do this. And, you know, and, and, the, and the Spirit says no. And, well, I just wanted to know, um, you know, when you talk about... Um, they like the wheat and the tares. Isn't there a wheat and tares 
in everyone that you know you that you struggle with. Because if it was just one person was weak and one person was bad, when one person that was weak lived forever. Well, but you must remember, of course, when we're talking about wheat and tares, uh, that is not our job to uh, try to uh, make judgment about this. This, that's, God will handle that. Uh, that is the whole problem, that why God talks about wheat and tares, that they look so much alike to our eyes uh, that we can't tell which is a tare and which is a wheat. Uh, and and so we're not to even try to make that kind of a judgment. But God has set up the mechanism by which to begin to make separation of the wheat and tares. From everything we read in the Bible, the mechanism is that God finally, at the end of the church age, has indicated, I'm finished with the churches. I now have abandoned the church all the local congregations. I have a, a, and, and put a Satan there to rule altogether. He's been ruling quite a bit anyway uh, through the terrors because they uh, have remained as citizens of Satan's dominion even though they may have been ruling in the churches. But now he officially is the ruler and and uh, the, the true believers are to get out, to get them out of the churches. And so anybody who, uh, that doesn't mean that every human being that gets out of the church is necessarily wheat, but it is, uh, but on the other side of the coin, those who insist on remaining in the churches and will continue to remain there right up until Judgment Day uh, are proving that they are terrors, that they do not want to obey this command uh, that has been set up by God as the mechanism to separate the wheat from the tares. Absolutely. There is something that I can't see. You know, even a good friend I met when you said, go to, go fellowship, go, go, go. And I went and I, I outreached a little bit and it was a little strange, but I did find somebody very close. But, you know, since I stopped going... They won't call well, me anymore. You know, they don't want to know how I'm doing anymore. I'm, yeah, well, you know, you know the Bible uh, does not say we can't have any kind of fellowship. It doesn't say we should have fellowship either with each other. Uh, this is not a command at all, but it's not. neither is it saying that we cannot meet with a fellow believers. Uh, but we may not meet with fellow believers trying to develop some kind of an official organization that uh, has some kind of spiritual uh, authority within it over those who belong uh, where we have a membership and where we are uh, are trying to follow the rules for a local congregation like uh, having uh, ceremonial laws like water baptism and the Lord's table. The moment we get into any of those kind of activities as we fellowship with each other, then we are, uh, then we are running contrary to the command of God. We are saying we know more than God knows. We know we need this fellowship. And the Bible doesn't say that. Our fellowship actually, as we read in First John chapter 1, and this is really the, the essence of our day in these few years that still remain until Christ returns, is, is in uh, 1 John chapter 1 verse 3, truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. In other words, it's me and God. That's the way we have to learn to live. That is where we have to seek our help. Uh, we, we have been accustomed to go to fellow hu humans in order to get encouragement, in order to get direction. But God says, no, you have to get accustomed to come to me, directly to me. It's you and God, me and God. And uh, this is the essence of of uh, the way Christians are living in the world in this day, the true believers. That's what I like about family radio. You know, you stick to the law, which is good, and I, you know, God just gives me faith. It's 
No. Well, thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome. Hello, Brother Camping? Yes. Good evening. My, my uh, question is in First John chapter 2. I'm sorry. Your voice is falling away. Speak right into your phone, please. My question is in First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, and which verse? Uh, verse 8. Verse 8? Yes. Uh, verse 8, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Is that the verse? Yes. My uh, question was, because it describes the three in one in, chapter, in verse 7, is the one referred to in chapter 8, the individuals, we, the no, believers? No, what you see in verse 7, God is saying there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Word, yeah, remember, became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word is the Lord Jesus, the Father, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Now, that's a divine mystery, how there can be one God revealed as three distinct persons, but... But that's because our finite minds are not able to understand an infinite God. But it is a true and trustworthy statement. Now, insofar as the way God works in this world, we find there are, there's the agreement between three entities. The Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, that's God himself. The water, the water is a figure pointing to the whole gospel itself, of which Christ is the very essence of the gospel. It is the gospel. It is, however, the whole plan of God's salvation and the blood. The blood is uh, focusing on the fact that Christ had to give his life for our sins. He had in, to endure the second death, the equivalent of spending an eternity in hell in order to provide salvation. But all three of these, the Holy Spirit, the gospel record itself, and the giving of Christ uh, uh, for our sins are totally in agreement. We have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping, I am glad I got through tonight. I have, Mr. Camping, I, I so need your help in understanding the end of the church age. I want to let you know I have read the end of the church age and after. I have almost finished Wheat and Tears. I listen to Open Forum and Family Radio all the time, and while I'm able to understand a lot of what you, you have taught and I realize only God's going to open my eyes. I do have still some, some real questions that I hope you can help me with. And the first one is, in the book, Wheat and Tears, you list three proofs that Jeremiah, the book, the, chap, uh, the, the book Jeremiah is talking about current day or churches today. And the first one is Jeremiah 2.2, 2, in which... You, um, the scripture goes, I remember the, the fondness of your youth or the love of your, the love of, of me with you and, and your youth. And you say that that's obvious that God could not be talking about, uh, the Jews or, the, or uh, Jerusalem and Judah of that day because they were disobedient in the wilderness. Um, however, I don't understand how God could have given that prophecy directly to Jeremiah if that wasn't, in fact, if he wasn't talking about the people of that day. Can you help me understand that? I have one well, more question. Well, I, I understand your question. You see, uh, uh, God is uh, using the nation, of his dealings with the nation of Judah at that period in history as an, a supreme example of how he is going to deal with the local congregations when he has finished 
utilizing them. And, uh, and so he uh, constantly, as you read the book of Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Isaiah or Joel or Nahum, uh, uh, book after book after book, you'll find that he's addressing uh, the, the local situation of that day. But when we uh, go through it, uh, we find numerous uh, at the time I wrote the book, Wheat and Tares, I thought I saw two or three uh, reasons why we could know that uh, it was talking about the end of the church age, using Judah as an example. But subsequent, as I have worked seriously in the book of Jeremiah, I have found a whole host of proofs that uh, of language that always identifies with our day, even though it is using Judah as a picture of our day. And when we uh, think about this for a moment, we must realize that God, uh, uh, if we look at the whole plan of God's salvation, the unfolding of his salvation plan, uh, during the 1480 years of Israel, and by the time uh, we came to uh, the days of Jeremiah, it had only been about uh, 800 years or so. Uh, let me see. They, they, they became a nation in 1447 to 580s. Well, maybe 900 years. Uh, they were about 900 years old, but they were just a small nation amongst the nations of the world. But then in A.D. 33, God uh, made a major expansion of the kingdom of God in the world by introducing the church age so that over the next 1955 years, God has, has developed the gospel program all over the world, all over the world. It is, uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, today it is far, far greater in expanse and extent uh, than it ever was in the days of Jeremiah. Jeremiah uh, was dealing with a, just, just a couple of million people uh, in the nation of, of, of Israel. Now, the fact that the gospel had to come to an end finally, or the, the uh, church age had to come to an end, is a big deal. It is a big piece of information. And we would expect, if God is writing uh, uh, quite a bit of language about the uh, is being finished with the nation of Israel, well, what would we expect, reasonably, when he finally has to talk about the end of the church age? Uh, that is a... Uh, that is a far, far bigger story. And uh, that is why when we really carefully study these passages that appear to deal with the end of uh, God's uh, dealings with Judah or Israel back there uh, 2,500 years ago, we find that the language actually is focused right on our day for many reasons. There are proof text sprinkled all through the book of Jeremiah and the book of Isaiah and the book of, of, uh, of, uh, and, and the book of Ezekiel and, and so on because it is a big deal. It is a huge piece of information that this great uh, organism, this divine orga organism called the local congregations that have been under the care and keeping of God for almost 2,000 years, that finally God is finished with them. Uh, and, and so God, therefore, we, or we would reasonably expect that God would have a whole lot to say about it, and he does, and that's why uh, uh, we have to continue to, uh, to uh, study these things in the Word of God, and I, all I find out as I continue to study, intensely study this, is further corroboration, always further corroboration. Uh, Mr. Camping, uh, however, could you please address specifically the fact that in your book you say 
that when Jeremiah 2-2 could not be talking about their day because during that period, the Jews had been disobedient. There's a reference in Jeremiah 2-2 that talks about uh, how they went astray, how they were loyal in the in the wilderness, and you say that they, he couldn't be, God couldn't be talking about that time because they were disobedient in the wilderness. However, God is specifically telling Jeremiah to tell the people of that well, day well, but it was because of that time. Yeah. Well, the fact is, if you compare this, for example, with Ezekiel chapter 16 or Ezekiel 22, you find that. Uh, or we compare this with uh, what we read in uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter three, where it says that that uh, they perished in the wilderness they because of unbelief and, and and other language of this nature. When we compare this, what what we read in Deuteronomy thirty one, where God is prophesying about what Israel would do. Let me read. Let me just read a couple of verses from Deuteronomy 31, which was being spoken right at the time that Judah, that that Israel was about to go into the land of Canaan, and and we read there in uh, in uh, verse 16 of Deuteronomy 31, the Lord said to Moses, Now this is just as they were, uh, Israel was ready to cross the Jordan River. Uh, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go in to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them. Uh, God is, and as we search out what God has what happened uh, to the nation of Israel throughout the years that followed all the way to the coming of the Lord Jesus. In fact, by the time Christ came, uh, they were ready to crucify him. They absolutely did not want to recognize him in any sense as the Messiah, as the one who came to be the Savior. And so, uh, uh, indeed, Jeremiah when God is saying, I remember the kindness of thy youth, the love of thy espousal, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Uh, the fact is, the church started out, uh, uh, you remember, there were 3,000 who were saved at Pentecost. We read about the uh, church in Philadelphia, uh, and, we, and there, we read about the other seven, six churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And while well, already there were serious problems that had arisen in most of these churches. Nevertheless, uh, there, uh, there, God had also some very fine things to say about them, which he never, that I'm aware of, had ever said about ancient Israel at their beginning. And so I think that was a correct statement that I made there. Mr. Camping? Yes. So are you saying that when God told Jeremiah to tell the people of that day that I remember the kindness of your youth, and that whole uh, Jeremiah 2, verse 2, 3, and 4, that he was really saying, he wasn't really talking to those people, he was really talking to us, even though he's telling Jeremiah to tell the people right then as if yeah. that was their news from God. But you must remember, the Bible is for us. The Bible is written to you and to me. It is true that the setting was back there in the days of Jeremiah. Uh, those people, uh, most of them probably had no idea what Jeremiah was talking about right then and there. But, uh, uh, but. Uh, uh, the, God wrote it in the Bible. The Bible is for us. You see, there's a mentality that is uh, that is t typical in in all the churches. They have a hermeneutic whereby that is a method of interpretation, where we are to look at the uh, at the earthly meaning, the the first meaning that comes, and we're not to look at a to see if there is any spiritual 
uh, meaning behind that. And that hermeneutic, and, and as, a, as a corollary to that hermeneutic, we, the question has to be asked, where uh, the student, the Bible student is told, what did this word mean to the people of that day? As if that says it all. Now, what they, this hermeneutic is flatly contrary to the way the Bible was written. The Bible was written with, where, as we read in Matthew 4, uh, or in Mark 4, that Christ spoke in parables. And without a parable, he did not speak. And a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning or a spiritual meaning. And so we have to ask questions when we read anything in the Bible, not what did it mean to the people of that day. That Bible is for us. Uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. What does it mean to us? And we don't have to worry about what it meant to them of that day. The Bible is for us. We have the Bible. And, and we have to look for the spiritual meaning. What is God? What is this passage? What does this have to do with the gospel? Now, I admit... You can go to any pastor, virtually any pastor, because their churches are pretty unified in this, uh, with their particular method of interpretation that is not biblical. And therefore, they, they will deny out of hand that the book of Jeremiah, for example, primarily is focused right on our day, the church age. Uh, they will not see it. They are blinded to it because they are approaching the Bible from a man-made hermeneutic. It has no biblical validation, and they are not looking at the Bible with a method of interpretation that was given by God's instruction. And so I can understand that, uh, that you are asking those questions. But uh, that... Mr. Camping? Um, I do understand the um, difference in the understanding or the interpretation of hermeneutic being literal or parabolic. I listen to family radio all the time, and it's because I've read your book and because I read the Bible that uh, I am not looking at this in a uh, literal, like this was only meant for that time. However, I am having a hard time making a link between when God told Jeremiah to say this to the people, he was talking to them of that day, and unless God was not being accurate about their kindness of their youth when they were in the wilderness, and there was a period of time when the Jews, right when they left Egypt, were very happy and very elated, and they, they stumbled many, 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 many times. But I don't see how God would give this to Jeremiah to talk to them then, and not to say that it can't mean for today as well, but it must mean that back then there had to be some kindness of their youth well, the, for the, God early on. There, there uh, certainly, because he's using them as an illustration, there may have been times when, uh, yes, there were, there were some true believers in national Israel, of course. Uh, there was a time of Solomon, for example, and there was a time of David. And, uh, but, uh, but basically... We find that the message is, uh, uh, while it, yes, I remember, they're used as an example. They're not used as the, the key teaching, but they are used as an example. So what is said is true of them. It is true of them, but not to the same degree or, or, or to the same extent that we find it is focused on our day. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Campy. Yes. Yeah, could you explain uh, Hebrews 10, 37, 38, and 39? Yes, Hebrews 10, 37. Let me turn to that a moment. Uh -huh. Hebrews 10, verse 37. 38 and 39 for yet 
For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back under perdition, but of them that believe that to the saving of the soul. Now what is your question? I was trying to understand well, who you, is the one that... You see, yeah, yeah, it's interesting when God is talking about the end of time, and there's a whole lot of the Bible that is addressed at this time in history, far more than we ever, ever thought. As I continue to study and intimately and intensively study the Bible, I find there's an enormous amount of information about our day. And I find that two things are happening. One is that, yes, Christ is about to come, uh, but at the same time, those who have had some truth and yet who have not become a child of God, they are losing what they did have. That is, it's like uh, they uh, are drawing back uh, because God has no pleasure in them. They have never become saved. But uh, on the other hand, there are those, and, and, and they're on their way to perdition. That is, uh, they're on their way to to standing for judgment and being cast into hell. And unfortunately, that applies to an enormous number of people within the local congregations. Uh, but on the other hand, there are those who are, are uh, 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 continuing to study the Bible and checking Scripture against Scripture, and we're learning more and more truth and uh, and and we're learning that God has a big saving program that he is uh, endeavoring or that he is going to bring into existence and is bringing into existence already in our day as it's testified by the language of uh, Revelation 7 where God says that there's a great multitude which no man can number uh, that would be robed with white robes that is they have become saved and they are those who come out of this time of the great tribulation the very time in which we're living living so there are two t tremendous th things going on which are strictly contrary to each other on the one hand there is judgment working in the churches where people are falling further and further away from the truth and our, as God put it in Second Thessalonians 2, he would send them a strong delusion to make them believe a lie. And they are going farther and farther away from the truth of the Bible. And on the other hand, outside of the churches where God is uh, still working uh, and bringing in the final harvest, there's, there's a great harvest of people coming that will be coming in if they're not already in. Uh, into the kingdom of God and we don't know who they are where they are but they will be coming in one by one all over the world okay then all right thanks a lot thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum brother camping there are many examples in the Bible of churches uh, being under the wrath of God believers told to leave the churches but I believe a lot of what you're teaching, like like the one woman was asking you in uh, Jeremiah, a lot of what you're teaching is um, Jeremiah is being used as a picture of Christ, not necessarily a church being under judgment. A lot of it is, uh, if you you know re rethink your teaching, it looks like Jeremiah as a type of Christ, and the believers are uh, seeing their sins, and the, the Bible's a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ, and I think you should relook uh, your teachings because you're teaching just about everything as the church. It's like every verse you look at, you're saying the church is under judgment. A lot of it is Christ under judgment. Jeremiah is a picture of Christ. Well, but the fact is, we don't. Uh, we have to look at the whole Bible. And for example, God, Christ said in Matthew 24, as he looked at the temple, which was a picture of the local congregations that would be built. 
Uh, he says there will c come a time, as in the context was that when he would return, there would be not one stone left upon another. And uh, we don't find anywhere in the Bible where God made any exceptions that there would be some a church here or a church there that would still remain faithful. God simply is finished utilizing that method. God established the method. He shifted from utilizing the nation of Israel to represent the kingdom of God externally. Uh, in the year A.D. 33, he shifted from them to the local congregations. And for 1955 years, he has used the local congregations as an external representation of the kingdom of God, even though an enormous number of them uh, really came under the rule of Satan long before the end of the church age, as, as they were seeded more and more by tares, and as they went farther and farther away from the truth of the Bible. But whatever was left, by the time we come to the end of the church age, uh, then, and God now is finished with that institution, and now uh, he, uh, he has uh, turned the whole business over to Satan, uh, and, and he is now completing his harvesting outside of the churches altogether. As I mentioned, Brother Kim, there are a lot of, uh, uh, and I think you might want to rethink that, what you're teaching about uh, no stone left, uh, look at the temple, there would be no stone left unturned. The temple could be also a picture of Christ who came under judgment. And uh, what I'm trying to do is point you to Christ instead of you teaching from every verse practically in Jeremiah that it's the end of the church. It, I would like you to rethink it and look at it as a picture of Christ under judgment rather than the church. And the believers, oh, no, I, the believers but, under judgment, running to Christ for salvation. Uh, no, the, you, we, there's a whole body of truth in the Bible, certainly, that points to Christ uh, being uh, the, the pay, making the full payment of eternal damnation on, er, on the, heart, the part of everyone who does become saved. The Bible uh, has a whole lot to say about that, of course. But the Bible also has a whole lot to say about those who were part of the claim to be part of the body of Christ, who were part of the congregation, uh, who were part of the church age, the local congregations. And uh, he speaks of that as a vineyard uh, uh, that brought forth wild grapes and so on. Uh, and and uh, he uses a whole lot of figures of speech in speaking of them. And uh, we can separate the two very distinctly, very distinctly. And we don't have to be afraid to, uh, like uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, they are two, uh, that they are two separate entities. And and uh, we just have to uh, become better and better acquainted with the whole. Bible and it's not easy it's not easy because the Bible is a very complex book and God has written his sentences in a way that they're, they're very readily misunderstood but God has also uh, shown us that the Bible is its own dictionary and it's its own commentary and as long as we're ready to check any conclusion in the light of anything else that we might find that relates in the Bible we are and are ready to uh, 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 to ask the Lord uh, for the direction. The uh, and and we don't trust our own minds. We will find the more and more truth. What I'm saying, Brother Camping, is when I see uh, the sins of, of Israel in the Book of Jeremiah, for example, uh, I could see myself there. Those are my sins. Also, if you ever taught a wrong doctrine, you're a false prophet. If you ever taught a wrong teaching. You've led people astray. You've been a false prophet. That's any any one of us. So I see the difference between you and I is I'm seeing my sins and it makes me run to Christ. You're seeing it's the, the corporate church under judgment. So it gets to point fingers at other other people. Those no, over there. No, excuse me. Not your... Excuse me. When God is talking about these shepherds, uh, He is indicating I'm going to destroy them. They're not going to come to Christ. He's going to destroy them. He's talking about false shepherds and pastors and, and prophets and priests. 
And again and again, the conclusion is, I'm, my wrath is upon you. I'm going to destroy you. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, there are passages where God talks about, I will save. If we read Ezekiel 36, for example, God says, I will do this. I will do that. I will do the other thing. Not because uh, you have uh, listened to the word of God. I simply will do this. And, uh, but the fact is that as we're reading about this, 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 these false, uh, these shepherds uh, and these pro prophets and so on in the book of Jeremiah, the constant theme is, and I'm going to destroy you. Uh, you think, for example, of this uh, just as an illustration. Look at Ezekiel chapter, chapter uh, 8 or chapter 9, rather, Ezekiel chapter 9, where it talks about the man with the, the men with the slaughter weapons. And where do they go? Where do they go? Uh, and they are told, go, uh, go after, the, uh, verse 5, uh, go through ye after, th uh, go through the city and smite. Let not your eyes smear, spare, neither have ye pity. Hold on, I'll be right back with you right after this message. We have a caller who is emphasizing a truce, namely that God does send his judgments. He does deal with, uh, with uh, Israel of old so that they would turn to him. And again and again, he did send oppression upon them. And then he would, they would cry out and, uh, and he would send a deliverer. And then again, they would turn and, and so on. And that, that, uh, scenario just went on through the years. But finally, the language that we're reading about in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel is of a different tone altogether. Here, we're, as an illustration, in Ezekiel chapter 9, uh, God is telling six men with slaughter weapons in their hand, in verse 4, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem, that is the holy city. That was the representation of the kingdom of God in the days of Ezekiel. And set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that he hath done in the midst thereof. In other words, there are some there who are true believers. And to the others, he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. Now you see, that's not the language of I'm, I am sending you warnings, that, and I'm sending you uh, judgments so that you will turn. This is final. This is, what, this is judgment day that God has in view. And, and Judgment Day is a, is a huge event. Uh, I have to admit that I have been brought up with the idea, yeah, finally the world comes to an end. We're going to see Christ come, and then he's going to set up his judgment throne, and, and, uh, and the unsaved will stand for judgment. Uh, that uh, it, it seemed to be a fairly simplistic kind of a thing. But I'm learning. No, Judgment Day is a big, big thing that's already taking place. Judgment begins with the house of God. God already, Christ is already present in the churches, preparing those that he plans to bring before the judgment for, throne for their time. And, uh, and uh, uh, it, there's no... Uh, there's not going to be any turning by the churches. There's not one piece of evidence in the Bible that any local congregation that is now under the judgment of God somehow will turn around and become a, a God-fearing body of believers again. That will not happen. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, just in a very practical way, and this is, this is just the facts of the case, we've been teaching 
now on family for several years already that the church age has come to an end, that God's judgment is upon the churches. And as we, and this message is, has been heard pretty extensively through the world. Believe you me, it's not said in a corner someplace, in secret somewhere, or in a hidden document. It is pretty well stated all through the world, and, and, and mo uh, most preachers and denominations have some idea of what is being said by these uh, people of Family Radio. And, and yet you don't find any denominations, any local congregations, where they're really uh, beginning to ask, where did we go wrong, and what do we have to correct, and how can it be that we are following this man-made gospel of salvation? We really ought to make correction. It is not happening. And that fits precisely with what God has been teaching here that these churches are under the judgment and instead and instead of drawing closer to God if anything they're going farther away there's less preaching on hell and damnation there's far more uh, uh, preaching on pu uh, public affairs uh, p p political issues and and uh, social issues and so on and uh, and uh, there's far more entertainment going on and uh, just a whole lot of different things. Uh, the uh, laws concerning marriage and divorce are getting looser and looser and so on. It's, it's exactly, precisely the way God has indicated it would happen. Brother Camping, um, those of us that were looking for a corporate church, we all understand this. We understood that even the churches that were teaching Christ and salvation were free will false gospels. We understood that. I just want to stay with the scriptures for one more moment. Now, the examples you just gave us in Jeremiah and, and Ezekiel, and also in, in something else like Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible says that these were all judgments, and God did destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. They were judgments, uh, they were examples to us of the judgment of God that would come on our sin. But we're saved by Christ. They were destroyed, yes, and others will be destroyed if Christ does not become their Savior. And all I'm saying is, you're teaching everything to do with the end of uh, a church, and I'm saying to relook at it as Christ is the Savior. Those sins are real judgments of destruction that did happen and would happen to us unless we're saved by Christ. Well, but you, but you see, God has put the gospel uh, in, a, in an environment of the world. He has laid out his gospel plan. For the first 9,500 years, there was no divine organism like a local congregation or a nation of Israel. God works strictly with individuals. We have the whole Bible before us uh, to, to find out how did God unfold his salvation plan. And then as we go through the Bible, we find that for a period of 1,480 years, the nation of Israel was the representation of the kingdom of God. Jerusalem, Zion, Judea, uh, the land of Canaan, they were the important uh, focal points of the gospel for all through the period until the coming of Christ. And then we see the shift at the time of the coming of Christ. We see it worked out in the book of Acts and so on. As God shifted from the local congregation to, or excuse me, from the nation of Israel being the external representation of the kingdom of God to the church age. And so then we continue to, so, so God has laid out for us uh, historically, we can, we can, God has given us enough, enough information so we can accurately see how God has developed the, the unfolding of his salvation plan into the world uh, throughout these 13,000 years of history. But we also find an enormous amount of information where God is closing it off because suddenly we come to the end of the world. And, and now what? what? What finally happens? He's gone from the, local, from the nation of Israel to the local congregations then what finally happened? How did all that end? And we're finding, as we carefully search the Bible, that God has 
also given a lot of information how he is transitioning from the end of the church or finishing off with the end of the churches and transitioning to that time of judgment and and finally the judgment throne and the, and this is all in the bible now it is also true that heretofore no one has been able to understand these things because these things have been sealed remember daniel and Daniel 12 was told, seal these things till the time of the end. But now we're at the time of the end, and so God is opening all of this up. And so, whereas heretofore we could have known quite a bit about the unfolding of God's salvation plan throughout the thousands of years that have passed in the past, now we can advance it right through to the very end because God is opening our eyes to a whole lot of things. And and we have to, uh, that's why I encourage anyone today to read the Bible more carefully than ever, because I'm finding on many passages, for example, uh, heretofore, uh, uh, when you would read uh, uh, Hebrews 6, the first verses 4 through 8, or Hebrews 10, uh, where it talks about effectively that if someone uh, deliberately sins, there no longer is the possibility of salvation. Or heretofore, that's been impossible to understand because it runs contrary to everything else the Bible teaches. But only when we understand that finally there is an arena, there is an environment where those two passages fit perfectly and that arena is the local congregations which now are under the authority of Satan totally that is uh, say uh, Christ is not doing any saving the Holy Spirit has absented himself therefore there is no possibility of salvation there if someone uh, sins and every sin ultimately is a deliberate sin uh, but only because we see the unfolding of God's salvation plan can these uh, passages begin to come to our understanding. We can begin to understand why God said what he did say. But uh, And this is all brand new to us. We're just learning about this. But, but we can check it out in the scriptures and we're finding harmony, harmony, harmony. It all ties together. It all locks in together more and more tightly as we the more we learn about it but thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum hello yes good evening this is uh brother Campy. yes this is he go ahead with your call uh yes sir um i was listening to the program and i think i'm pretty much agree with the gentleman before and my question is that um, what I want to know is if it is so true that um, God let the local churches as you say um, why was it so important for Paul and all the apostles to go to each church and tell them to continue on and there's not a scripture after that that says well, uh, there'll be a certain time that you'll stop. Well, the fact is, first of all, the uh, the doctrine, the teaching that God has finished with the local congregation is very unacceptable in any local congregation. If I went into uh, into a church and taught this, uh, I preached there on a Sunday and taught that to the congregation, they'd throw me out of my ear. Uh, because this would be like I'm trying to destroy that congregation. Uh, they wouldn't want to hear it. And uh, so we can't very well go there and and preach from their pulpits this. It would be similar to the Apostle Paul, you know, when he began, when he became a child of God and learned about Christ. Then he went into his synagogues that he had been very... Uh, much accepted by before because he also was a Pharisee 
Uh, and now they threw him out. They, they stoned him and left him for dead. They beat him with whips repeatedly uh, because they didn't want to hear the truth. And the, similar, the same thing is happening today. However, as we are, uh, God has designed this world, he has opened the, uh, the minds of the secular world to develop all these methods of communication that we have today. And so as we're able to uh, bring this, uh, these kind of truths out on the airwaves by radio and, and uh, by satellite broadcasting and Internet and so on, uh, the potential for people within the local congregations to hear about this is very, very great. And so it's, it filters into the local congregations. And so there are individuals asking their pastors, what about this and what about that? And so the, uh, the churches are hearing about it. They are hearing about it. But what is their reaction? Do you hear of any churches that are are throwing in the towel and say no we 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 uh, uh, we finally see it we don't want to be a church anymore we we are going to disband altogether and our pastor is no longer a pastor and our elders are no longer elders i i just haven't heard very much about that at all because it's following what the bible indicated the the uh, the uh, fact is that uh, th it will continue this way right up until the last day that the churches will be insisting oh no we're safe and secure uh, we uh, Christ is going to come as a thief in the night uh, and they're not about to uh, get interested in in these things that that come right from the Bible and yet are so contrary to what they are teaching well, I think to myself, I personally believe you can almost make almost anything make sense with the Bible. I mean, I've even heard people say and um, go with Genesis and try to explain how God made the herb of the ground and that smoking weed is something that God has accepted to do, but that's not the truth. Now, the facts of what's on that piece of paper, the Bible, is there. God made every herb for man. But it doesn't say that you use it in that manner. So yeah, but I, I just don't have a scripture reference that tells me what you're telling me, that exactly what scripture reference that says that you know, only you, because I've never heard anybody else say this, that God has left the local church. I've never heard anyone else say that. And I don't know a single scripture that would pinpoint and exactly tell me that that's true. Well, you see, the, yeah, of course. You're correct that people do all kinds of things with the Bible. God wrote the Bible so that it fosters unbelief. You can, there are, I can point out verse after verse that can, that you can uh, read it as it stands and it'll teach something. Uh, you'll be convinced you're learning something that is in actuality absolutely contrary to what the whole Bible teaches. It is necessary to compare scripture with scripture. But because we're not doing this just promiscuously or just uh, to get attention in some way, uh, we've gone to the effort of laying out this material in books like Wheat and Tares and The End of the Church Age and Time Has an End, and, uh, and uh, so that uh, those who are seriously concerned about these matters can be helped in searching the Bible concerning this uh, and and uh, uh, it's 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 uh, it's uh, we we can take the position well uh, you can say anything you want and people do say anything they want but on the other hand if they are reading uh, are finding that there is a passage after passage after passage of the bible that that correlates that focuses in on this that that adds further proofs and so on well then we have to begin to think hey this may be very serious this is something i better better consider very very seriously more than that if we are honest and we look at the general tenor of what is happening in the local congregations some of us are old enough to know how it was 50, 60 years ago and compare with what it is today. There's a vast change in general. There are a few local congregations 
that you could say they've hardly changed, but basically there are vast changes that have occurred, and and it's pretty hard to say that any of the changes have been for the good. Uh, and and if we if we're really honest about it, we have to say something is going wrong. Something is going wrong. There have been individuals, for example, who have gone into a city trying to find a church that they can still somehow uh, be happy with and they've gone to one congregation and then another and then another and another and it isn't in any time at all and they find that they're being taught things that they know are contrary to the word of God this do-it-yourself salvation plan for example is is a terrible terrible thing that is going on and yet it is everywhere every place you turn you find this idea you Christ paid for the sins of the world and you just have to reach out and accept him and believe on him and that is absolutely a man-made gospel and yet the churches are not giving it up uh, the whole hermeneutic that they use is uh, cannot be proven from the Bible. Their method of interpreting, interpreting the Bible, and so on. And these are the facts. These they just exist. Uh, but we don't we don't uh, arrive at our conclusion based on what we see in, that is happening in the churches. We base our conclusions on what the Bible brings us to. But then uh, once we have our conclusion and we're and we find that we are are in harmony with whatever we search out in the Bible concerning that truth, and then we look at the local congregations, we find that it fits, that that's exactly the way it is. Uh, but, of course, there are a lot of people who are, are not... It takes a lot of work to... to uh, to uh, search this out and they're and they just uh, like the status quo and and so they can just sit on the sidelines and criticize and say well I don't buy that well that's their privilege they can do that but I'll tell you these matters are dreadfully serious we're not talking about uh, whether uh, gasoline is going to cost a little more or a little less. We're not talking about uh, whether we're uh, going to uh, run into a recession or not. What we're talking about is heaven or hell, eternal damnation versus eternal uh, being eternally with the Lord Jesus. And, and, and I'll tell you, these are the greatest and without any question, the greatest uh, uh, matters that any human can ever ever face and so everyone better get really serious about this really serious and if we if for example in family radio if we had a reputation of coming with dreams and visions or with uh, wild-eyed ideas that really had no biblical foundation well that would be one thing but you know God in his mercy has uh, guided us so that we have learned to just trust the Bible and only present the Bible, only present the Bible. Uh, and and, and uh, even having a program like this where anybody can call in and, and uh, they'll be given the opportunity to show a verse here or there that they've found that seemingly might contradict something that is taught by family radio we want to listen to it we want to hear that verse and look at that to make sure that we don't have to make a correction because if a correction is needed we want to make the correction we don't care about our own personal ego or pride in any sense all we want is biblical truth but thank you thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you, Mr. Camping. Um, I'm calling. I hope we have enough time. Um, I will begin with um, the first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 27, if you could please. John 2, verse 27? Yes, sir. The Gospel of John? Yes, sir. The Gospel. Chapter 2, verse 27. All right, let's look at that. John 2. Because I ordered your books, Wheats and Pears, as well as the yeah. 
No, John two. Yeah, you're, uh, that only that only the has the first epistle of uh, the general. Oh, epistle you of want the first John? The first John. Yeah, first that. John epistle okay, of John. Uh, I'm sorry, I did wasn't clear. Okay, first John chapter, chapter two, two, verse twenty seven. Verse twenty two. Let's turn to that. We'll get to that in just a moment. First chapter two, verse, verse twenty seven. Twenty two. Verse two, number two, just two. Yeah. T W L. Which verse? Chapter 2, verse 27. Verse 27. But the anointing, is that the one? Yes. Which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and even is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now, what is your question? My question is, how would that correlate with, with uh, you uh, you as a teacher with the uh, end of the church age message that you... Oh, well, you see, but, it, um, a, a teacher, you never want to trust a teacher. You'll never hear me saying, trust me, I know. You'll never hear me say that because I don't want anybody to trust me. I want them to trust the Bible. Now, God does raise up church teachers in order to help explain and help to guide people into the Word of God, but the teacher himself is never the authority. The Bible is the authority, and it is God who has to apply the Word of God uh, to the minds and hearts of those that he plans to do so. I can't. I can't convince anybody of truth at all. God has to do it. And this is what God has in, in view here, that, that it, it, this parallels. You know, it's interesting that this parallels what God says in Hebrews 10 about the, about the new covenant. He says, uh, in, or, in, or where does he say that? In, uh, in, uh, in uh, verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. And after those days, it means it's speaking about our day. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. In other words, God makes the application. We, as a teacher, simply uh, show, uh, 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 help to open up people's vistas of what the Bible is teaching so they can look at it. But finally, God has to make the application. And that again, you know, it, it really identifies with what we read in Ezekiel 36, where God says, and he's talking again about the same time, the same situation. He says in verse 26 of Ezekiel 36, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, that is a heart that identifies with Christ as the Word who became flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And you see this? This is, uh, this is uh, what, uh, what is happening today. We in family radio don't get anyone saved. We don't get anybody saved. It's not our job to save anybody. God has to do it. It's our job simply to get people into the Word of God so that God will do the teaching uh, right from His Word into their hearts. But right. now, and, um, now we've come to the end of our time. Lord willing, we'll be back again tomorrow evening for another edition of the Open Forum. Until then, may the Lord richly bless you.